All right, so this is chapter three, Bio 225, chapter three, bacteria and archaea. Uh, with chapter three, we actually start getting into some microbiology. Uh, if you remember back to chapter one, we divided microbes into prokaryotes and then the akaryotes as well, which are those without a nucleus, and then eukaryotes, which are those with a nucleus. In chapter three, we look at the microorganisms that lack a nucleus. The, these are the bacteria and the archaea. So let's get going on that one. Here's your list of uh, key terms for the chapter. As we progress through the chapters, you'll see that the key terms list typically get a little longer. Uh, whether you realize it or not, you're actually learning a, a new language. Uh, it's the language of microbiology. And like learning any language, vocabulary is its base. Uh, terms such as you see here are going to allow you to better understand the more in-depth information that comes later. Plus, like I said, it's, uh, you know, quick and easy points on a test. So with these, as the chapters get a little bit longer, I divide them up into uh, parts or sections. I record them in different sections. It's just easier for me to record them that way. Generally, it's easier for you to digest the information in just small uh, blocks. And so chapter three has uh, three sections. So let's start with uh, part one of three. Let's start by looking at what uh, makes the prokaryotic and the akaryotic cells so different from eukaryotic cells that we are, we're going to study in chapter four. The bacteria and archaea uh, differ from eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are sometimes called animal cells in basically uh, three important ways. First, it's how they package their DNA. Uh, as you know, Eukaryotic cells, cells like yours and mine, pack their DNA inside of a compartment called a nucleus. Now, this has its advantages, and it has some disadvantages as well, uh, but we'll look at that in Chapter 4. The bacteria and archaea cells uh, do not have a nucleus. Uh, as we will see, their DNA is said to be sort of free-floating in the cytoplasm. It's not really free-floating. It just kind of looks that way. Um, having your genetic material in direct contact with the cytoplasm allows bacteria and archaea to perform a few beneficial tricks that a eukaryotic cell can't do. Second, internal structures. We say the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell is a membrane-bound organelle. So a membrane-bound organelle is essentially a sac made out of special lipid molecules um, that the eukaryotic cell uses to compartmentalize different functions inside of the cell. By doing this, the eukaryotic cell can perform some complex cellular processes uh, compared to prokaryotic cells. In addition to the nucleus, the eukaryotic cell has many other types of these compartments, uh, organelles spread throughout the cytoplasm. Bacteria and archaea do not. Uh, they have very few, if any, membrane-bound organelles. Cellular processes are, for the most part, carried out directly in the cytoplasm and maybe a couple other places in the in the cell we'll see later on. Finally, cell wall makeup. The makeup of a microorganism's cell wall is not only important to how the cell functions, but it's critical to helping us identify the microbe. Most bacteria and archaea have cell walls. What this cell wall is made of varies depending on uh, the species, but it's usually there in some form. While there are eukaryotic cells that have cell walls, like plants and fungi, most eukaryotic cells uh, we, we will study really generally lack a cell wall. Uh, again, there are exceptions, and we will discuss those in upcoming chapters. So we'll come back and briefly revisit the archaea at the end of the chapter. Uh, we will see that many of them do not live in the same environments that we do. So for now, we're going to focus on the bacteria. Um, that we are in contact with pretty much every hour of every day. Uh, being able to identify them starts with understanding their unique shapes and how these shapes are arranged. A single bacterium is capable of carrying out all of its life processes independently. Even when bacterial cells, cells appear to cluster together or join together and change, they're still functioning as individual independent cells as far as we know. Uh, at times, though, bacteria will get together and cooperate. Uh, while they still function as individual cells, uh, bacteria in these cooperative groups will begin to change the way they do things. They begin to communicate with other bacteria and sometimes other types of microbes that are in their neighborhood. They begin expressing different genes that may change the way they behave. The collection of bacterial cells in these groupings 
that actually truly starts to look like a multicellular organism. We call these collections biofilms, and they can give us quite a headache when it comes to controlling infections. But again, more on that in later chapters. The bacterial cells are small compared to our cells, about 10 times smaller. Uh, some bacteria use the size difference to their advantage. There are types of bacteria that make us sick that are actually able to live inside of our cells. They actually have to live inside of our cells. Uh, some of them would not be able to survive very long outside of our cells. We call these bacteria obligate intracellular parasites. So as an example, the bacteria that causes the sexually transmitted infection gonorrhea is able to live inside of the white blood cells of our immune system. They hide out in the very cells that are supposed to kill them. A neat little trick. Uh, it's only possible due to their small size. And most bacteria also have a defined shape and come in fairly constant uh, or consistent arrangements of cells. However, this is not always the case. Some bacteria exhibit a quality known as pleomorphism. This refers to a change in the characteristic of the bacterium depending on environmental factors like temperature and pH. Uh, some bacteria will change their shape and look like a totally different microbe under different environmental conditions. So it's important for us to know which bacteria are pleomorphic. A bacterium that is capable of making a sick needs to be quickly identified. In pleomorphism, what the bacteria looks like depends on the conditions in which we view it. We can easily be fooled if we're not careful to pay attention to how bacteria may change depending on their environment. But in most cases, bacteria will have a constant shape and arrangement. Here you can see the five most common. A coccus bacterium is spherical. A bacillus is a rod-shaped bacterium. Vibrio bacteria are rod-shaped, but they have a little slight little curve to them, sometimes referred to as a gull wing shape. Spirillum are spiral cells that resemble corkscrews. Spirochetes take the corkscrew shape to the extreme. These bacteria are tightly twisted like a, like a spring. Those are the five basic shapes of bacteria. Now, as bacteria divide, they may stay attached to one another. These attachments create specific arrangements of the five basic shapes and help to identify what type of bacteria they are. The cocci have the most diverse arrangements. This is because, because they're a sphere, they can divide in all four planes. A single spherical bacteria is a coccus, plural would be cocci, uh, like we saw in the previous slide. If the bacteria divides and two stay together, we call it a diplococci. Diplococci and diplococci you will certainly see. The last two common arrangements, staphylococci and streptococci, um, as you'll see as well. And a regular cluster of uh, spherical cells is a staphylococci. These are clearly visible under the microscope. And again, you're going to see these uh, in lab when we do the gram stain. If several bacteria stay attached end to end, this forms an arrangement known as a streptococci. Uh, you'll get a chance to see these chains under the microscope in lab later as well. Two other possible arrangements include groups of four bacteria called tetrads and cubical geometric shapes of even numbers called sarcina. Tetrads and sarcina are difficult to see in our lab. And I mean, there's no real instances of them when we look at uh, the infectious diseases later on. So this, uh, this is the last time we'll, we'll use those terms. Rod-shaped bacteria, these are the bacilli. Uh, less varied arrangements. This is because they only divide in two planes. A single rod-shaped bacteria is a bacillus. If two bacilli stay attached, they form a diplobacilli. Long chains of connected rod-shaped bacteria are streptobacilli. Hopefully uh, you're noticing a theme here when uh, with the naming of the bacterial arrangements. If these long chains fold back on themselves, they form an arrangement known as a palisade. Now, historically, a palisade was a defensive structure, sort of like a a fence around a castle or a fort. So when bacilli form palisades, they, they look kind of like little picket fences. Palisades are difficult to pick out as well in our lab, so I'm not going to focus too much on them again. Certainly you want to focus on the singles, the doubles, and the chain arrangements of the rod-shaped bacteria. Vibrio, spirillum, and spirochetes rarely stay attached when they divide, so there are no real particular arrangements for them. As I mentioned, knowing shapes and arrangements of bacteria is incredibly important to identify them. Let's, let's take a look at one. 
So in chapter 19, we're going to look at uh, several infectious diseases affecting the respiratory tract. One of these is the common upper respiratory tract infection, strep throat. After a few days, the bacterial infection becomes noticeable as a red and swollen mucosa of the throat. Inflammation causes the pain associated with strep throat as well as the characteristic white patches of dead, dead tissue that appear um, around across the tonsils. If you take your child or even yourself to the doctor with the suspicion of strep throat, they'll do a rapid strep test in the office. This test checks for surface markers on the bacterium Streptococcus pyogenes, which is the causing the infection. For you and me, that's pretty much where it ends. Positive strep test and you're leaving with an antibiotic and that will make you feel better in a day or two. However, strep tests have a certain degree of inaccuracy. So your doctor actually sends a sample to a lab for analysis as well that you usually never hear about. There, the bacteria will be grown on an auger plate, just like you're going to use in our labs, and then will be viewed under a microscope for definitive identification. Under the microscope, the bacteria will appear as long chains. So the shape of the bacterium is a coccyx. Several bacteria stay joined together as they divide to form long chains, a strepto arrangement, Put the two together and you get streptococcus species of bacteria. It's really just that simple. Now, most bacteria, especially the ones that make us sick, have structures that extend off of the cell surface. Some of these are the very reason that the bacteria makes us sick in the first place. So just as your arms and legs, commonly referred to as your appendages, extend away from your trunk, these structures extending from the cell surface are also known as appendages. The appendages formed by bacteria can be divided into three classes depending on their function, movement or motility, attachment, and channel formation. Two structures that provide the bacterium with motility are flagella and axial filaments. Bristle-like structures called fimbriae are used by bacteria for attachment to surfaces, including surfaces like us. Uh, Pili and nanotubes form channels between neighboring bacteria, but for slightly different purposes. The flagella are a bacterial appendage for motility. The flagellum is actually it's a complex structure. It transforms biochemical energy made by the bacterium into mechanical energy used for moving through its environments. Um, as the motor of the flagellum spins, it, it, it's, it's actually like a microscopic motor. The tail attached to it spins like a propeller of a boat. This pushes the bacterium through the environment. The ability of a bacterium to move plays a significant role in its ability to cause human disease, and we'll see again in later chapters. Just as bacteria come in a variety of shapes and sizes, those that have flagella have a variety of possible arrangements of those appendages. Polar flagella arise from one or both ends of rod-shaped bacteria. Other bacteria have multiple flagella spread across their cell surface. There are specific names for these distributions um, over the surface of the bacteria, but they're not necessary to know for our purposes, I don't believe. So I'm not going to test you on those names. Spirochete bacteria have an unmistakable uh, wriggly motion as they move. This is due to a specialized type of flagellum known as a periplasmic flagellum or axial filament. Unlike bacteria that have their flagella on the outer surface of the cell, spirochetes have a flagellum that is sandwiched between the cell wall and the cytoplasmic membrane. The structure and function of this flagellum is essentially the same as a more traditional flagellum. Uh, the difference is that the unique configuration causes the corkscrew-shaped bacteria to, to twist as it moves. This twisting motion then propels the spirochete through its environment. Fimbriae are the bacterial version of Velcro. Uh, these are tiny little hair-like fibers that are spread across the surface of uh, some bacteria. And like Velcro, they're inherently sticky. Uh, fimbriae allow bacteria to stick to surfaces. Uh, sometimes these surfaces are composed of other cells, like the lining of my urinary tract, in the case of a bacteria that causes urinary tract infections. Sometimes these surfaces may be inanimate objects made of glass or plastics. Fimbriae play a significant role in the formation of biofilms and uh, that they allow the bacteria to begin to colonize these surfaces. For example, biofilms that form on the surface of a plastic Indwelling urinary catheter are the direct result of bacteria using their fimbriae to stick to the plastic of the catheter and to each other. 
Pili are appendages that create channels between neighboring bacterial cells. Pili channels are used in a process called conjugation. In conjugation, uh, pili are formed between two compatible bacteria. The channel is then used to transfer genetic material from the donor cell to the recipient cell. This transfer of genetic material um, may be of no consequence, or it may add to the recipient's ability to cause disease. We're going to see that shortly. Nanotubes are also appendages of channel formation. They tend to be shorter than pili, but may interconnect multiple bacteria in a colony at the same time. Nanotubes are not used for conjugation. They're used for communication or and or to share nutrients between cells. An interesting benefit that nanotubes provide for the bacteria that form them is that they allow the transfer of electrons from inanimate surfaces to, to the cell. Uh, these electrons are then used to power the metabolic machinery of the cell without the need of other nutrients. This gives bacteria a really big survival advantage in places with low or no nutrient content. So as an example, so photos of the Titanic on the ocean floor show it covered in and hanging rust sickles or rusticles, that's what they're called. Uh, these are actually large colonies of bacteria that are using nanotubes to strip electrons from the iron in the ship's hull and using them to power the cells. The bacteria in these colonies are using the ships as basically giant batteries to run their metabolism in a place where there's actually very few other resources. All right, that ends part one of three for chapter three. We'll continue uh, with chapter three in part two in the next recording.